Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. The show you're about to hear is part four of our five-part O'Reilly AI New York series, sponsored by Intel Nirvana. As I've mentioned before, I am super grateful to Intel for helping make this series possible, and I'm excited about the cool stuff they launched at the O'Reilly AI conference, including version 2.0 of their Neon framework and their new Nirvana graph project. Be sure to check them out at intelnirvana.com. If you haven't already listened to the first show in this series, where I interview Naveen Rao, who leads Intel's AI products group, and Hanlin Tang, an algorithms engineer on that team, it's Twimmel Talk number 31, and you definitely want to start there. My guest for this show is Reza Zadeh. Reza is an adjunct professor of computational mathematics at Stanford University and founder and CEO of the startup Matroid. Our conversation focused on some of the challenges and approaches to scaling deep learning, both in general and in the context of his company's video object detection service. All right, on to the show. All right. Hey, everyone. I am here with Reza Zadeh from Stanford University and Matroid. Reza gave a presentation earlier today at the O'Reilly AI conference, and I'm excited to catch up with him here. Hi, Reza. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here in New York. I appreciate the time you're taking to to talk about machine learning, AI, and and the stuff I love. Absolutely. I love it too. And I've been having a bunch of fun talking to folks over the past couple of days. Why don't we start with a little bit of a little bit of introduction? Tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up uh, doing what you're doing in AI. Sure thing. So I've been working on machine learning for around 12 years now, since I was 18. It started at Google working on machine translation, language modeling, and word alignments for machine translation back when it wasn't neural in any way, more mm -hmm. traditional phrase-based models, transitioned into distributed machine learning as a tool. So how do you take, say, 100 machines and train a machine learning model that is either scaled across large model, large data, or many models? Okay. And that manifested itself in, in, in the machine learning library in Apache Spark. So that's one of the projects that, that I've worked on heavily. More recently... The Twitter who to follow suggestions, the recommendation algorithms on there. Mm -hmm. So if you go onto Twitter.com, there are a lot of things on there. But one of the things you'll notice is the recommendation pane. It says who right. do you want to follow, and that the, the algorithms behind that were actually part of a, a chapter in my PhD thesis. And then oh, wow. after after graduating from Stanford, I got hired by my department to do a distributed machine learning class, as well as a more data science oriented class with graph theory in it. Okay. And while an adjunct professor at Stanford, I started Matroid. Recently, computer vision has been completely taken over with machine learning. And I've right. been I've been working on machine learning my whole career. So the, my ever since I've had a job, it's been about machine learning. Mm -hmm. And because computer vision is so overtaken with it now, it was the perfect time for me to get into it, especially since computer vision also went through a revolution, many problems that weren't possible before became possible. It seemed right. like the perfect opportunity. And so now most of my time goes into Matroid, the computer vision company. And that was a talk today. I gave a talk about Matroid. We've recently released Matroid.com is the website. And I'm currently thinking hard about deep learning and computer vision on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Your talk span both the distributed machine learning, scaling machine learning, and Matroid. They're kind of integral conversations. Is that right? That's right. So Matroid is a studio for creating and using detectors. Okay. Now, these detectors are very heavy duty in terms of computational cost. Mm -hmm. And to be able to scale such a system to many detectors and many users and many streams, we had to build an entire cluster of commodity machines with fancy hardware GPUs in particular and scale them up and down dynamically. So as more people use our system, we need to scale up, scale down, mm -hmm. so that we're not wasting resources. And the way we do that is essentially all of it is 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 new. And we are particularly good at making sure it's also fault tolerant, so that if mm -hmm. 
So just a little background. As a service, we provide the ability to monitor a stream of media. So let's say you're watching a TV channel and you want to see when does a Coca-Cola logo show up on this TV channel. And then you, you can, of course, multiply that by all the TV channels in the world, which sure. is very hard to do for an intern in a production studio. But mm-hmm. that's the kind of thing that's possible now and we provide as a service. That, the fact that there are thousands of thousands of streams that could come at us and some, some of them could go down and it could come up and that could be our fault. We have to deal mm-hmm. with that. There has to be computational ability to run these models. There has to be RAM to run these models. These mm-hmm. are these models are have to fit into smaller gpus these gpus have small amounts of ram not smaller gpus gpus with small amounts of ram Mm -hmm. these are all challenges that have to be solved at the same time to be able to provide a service that 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 we provide on top of that there's a ui component so we have our own video player the video player lets you have a poor man's reinforcement learning happening okay and all of that tightly integrated provided as a service is matroid I don't know how much you want to go into Matroid itself as a product. I'm happy to talk about either the distributed machine learning mm-hmm. aspect of more general distributed machine learning or the distributed machine learning aspect of Matroid or machine learning in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, up to you where we go with that. So one immediate question that I had was in you describing what Matroid is doing, it made me think of Google's recent... In fact, I think just today they put this their video object detection offering into beta. Are you doing similar things or tell me a little bit about Matroid and kind of in the context of that? So the the Google offering is primarily focused towards developers. So right. uh, the, the Google customer or the Microsoft or the other customers, there would be people who can code, mm-hmm. people who are already somewhat familiar with machine learning. Right. They're providing and, APIs. And the way and the reason that Google sells this is because they want people to come to Google Cloud Platform and spend right. compute. That is something that that is totally not our customer. Our customer is someone who has a need to watch media. And that happens mm-hmm. where it's the production so this might intern. Be an ad agency exactly. or a brand exactly. monitoring company That's right. or something That's like right. that. That's right. So there's people who can't code. Right. And there's very different customers. So you're offering a solution as opposed to a set of APIs and... Yes, that's right. Okay. Although there is overlap in the technologies used. For sure, we're both right. using convolutional neural networks. For right. sure, we're both scaling machine learning in some way. But the customer is actually very different. Mm-hmm. The UI is very different. And that's that's the differentiation. We don't directly sell to developers, although we have an API that developers can use and if okay. they're sophisticated enough. But we're essentially like a Photoshop for computer vision. You just right. have to be determined at clicking and pointing, Mm -hmm. you don't need to learn programming to use us. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you said that was interesting was poor man's reinforcement learning. Yes. Tell me about that analogy and what that means in your world. Sure thing. So we have this whole detector creation flow within Matroid. So if Mm -hmm. you go to matroid.com, you can create a detector for whatever you want. And in fact, during the talk today, I made some examples of whatever I want. Right. So I made in the, in the talk today, I made a detector for cars. Okay. Make a like detector. a live demo? Yeah. Oh, awesome. absolutely. It was a most, I never, I, I used like five slides and the rest of the 40 minutes was in on Matroid.com. Okay. So it was almost entirely a live demo that you can do if you make an account on there yourself now and do everything I did. There's a flow there to create a detector. And this detector, mm-hmm. once it's, tr- once it's created, it takes three, four minutes to create. Okay. Once it's created, you can immediately see how well it's performing by running videos through the video player. And you okay. immediately see, okay, with a video player, you see, okay, it's working on these areas of the video. It's not working on these areas of the video. And because we have our own video player, you go in and you can tag where that, where those mistakes happen, where you mm. want to reinforce correct okay. attitude and where you want to, I guess, give negative examples and say, no, this is incorrect. You can do that very quickly with our, with our video player and then that goes back into reinforcing correct attitude in the model. Got it. So then the model can be retrained then, and now you have a better model. That's why I said it's a poor man's reinforcement learning because it's not traditional reinforcement learning where we have the whole loop right. taken care of. You have to provide us with examples through the video player, right. but it's exactly the same spirit of reinforcement learning sure. that, that an agent is essentially exploring. So you create a model, you have some, some policy you think is right, you right. run a video through, you, you observe how the detector is working. If it's working well enough, you're done. You go to town, you use that detector. Mm-hmm. If it's not working well enough, you can, you can iterate on it and reinforce correct behavior. 
And the UI is essentially what allows a human to become the reinforcement learner. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the kind training loop is fast. Tagging, training, exactly. learning loop. For computer vision, strictly okay. for computer vision, not for general reinforcement learning. We are not a deep learning as a service company. We are not a machine learning as a service company. Right, right. And is it primarily video or also still images? And oh, of video? course, it's also still images. Okay. Yeah, that's just something that is... But in terms you, of the use cases and like where Oh, most of our actually... customers care about video. Because you, okay. if you remember that value proposition, the value proposition is... You're hiring someone to look at vast amounts of media, right? Mm-hmm. You're hiring someone to look at vast amounts of media. Sure, that vast amount of media could be a very large image collection, yeah. but more often than not, you would hire someone to watch very long videos because right. then you would have a need for to hire a person. Okay. If you have a hundred pictures, chances are you still wouldn't hire a person. If you have a thousand pictures, chances are you still wouldn't hire a person. Mm-hmm. If you have millions of images and photos, yeah, sure, you might hire a person at that point. Mm-hmm. But there are way fewer of those cases than there are people who have vast amounts of video. Right. It's very easy to have a camera on 24-7. It's very easy to need to watch TV 24-7. Mm-hmm. There are multiple streams of video, ever-growing amounts of video streams in the world now mm-hmm. because cameras are cheap. And we expect them all to have the ability to have eyes on them with, with Metroid or other services. Mm-hmm. So we talked a little bit about branding use cases. I'm envisioning surveillance style use cases as well. What are the kind of the major clusters of use so cases? So we have we have two big industries that we're focused on. One is TV mm-hmm. and the other is security. Okay. So, oh, the, so those are the two. <laughs> that's it. We, as a startup, we can't be too sure. broad, right? Yeah. And so, yes, you can actually just take your home camera and integrate it with Metroid as well. So uh, you, if you want notifications when some particular person is at home. Okay. You can set that up pretty easily. To the level of person. Person A versus person B versus yeah. person C. Or or more interesting things that that could be funny like like maybe you want a detector that just pings you whenever someone with a beard comes in. I'm being silly here, yeah. but that, that's the level of customizability that we have there. Oh, that's right? interesting. So so if someone with a beard walks in the room, you want a notification. It's uh-huh. kind of silly, right? But more interesting, you could do something like maybe a kid has a hand in a cookie jar yeah <laughs> that'd be pretty funny yeah or opening up you know you're, a you're on a diet and you're opening right? up the fridge after a certain time at night or something oh like yeah that, and you pick or... up the coke instead of the right that's a that's that's an esoteric use case but absolutely possible if you put a camera in front of your fridge yeah we'll be able to detect whether you're picking up a diet coke or a regular coke oh wow <laughs> yeah what's it's interesting that, that in fact I, I i bought a i bought a pepsi and a coke for the demo today from uh-huh. one of the hell all carts downstairs in New York and uh-huh. just put them in front of it and very easily figured out that one's a Pepsi, the other Coke. I didn't have diet versus regular, but that's that, that would be a new detector. Okay. It's interesting that video is becoming, or computer vision in general, I guess, is becoming almost like, I don't know, like a lingua franca detector. The background thought here is, you know, there's a point in time that I wanted to do like a home automation project and you know, the question was, how am I going to figure out, you know, who's in the house and who's not and that kind of thing. And, you know, I, this was years ago and I got into, you know, walking around with like, you know, is NFC going to work or Bluetooth tags or things like that. And the computer vision stuff has advanced so much that now you would just throw up a camera and use that. And it's opened up like so many different avenues. You mentioned something well, in any case, so another application that... Well, you're absolutely right. Computers are, are getting eyes, yeah. and that's incredibly exciting. It used to be that it was a blob of numbers to the computer, and now it right. can understand what's going on, and to the point where it becomes the ultimate sensor. So yeah. instead of having all these weird sensors, we can just have cheap, really, really cheap cameras. I mean, these ca- cameras are incredibly cheap, and they are incredibly powerful. And we want to give them more and more power. That's exactly what Metroid is. We think mm. that the ability to sense things through your eyes is immensely powerful. When you think about it, a computer can take in our eyes, rather. Our eyes take in so much information, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely megabytes and megabytes of information per second is, is going in through our eyes. Mm-hmm. But as humans, we only have the ability to type at like a very slow speed. So, right. so our our eyes are giving us much more information than we could give a computer with clicking yeah. and with most sensors too, actually, I would say. Mm-hmm. So so most sensors out there, they would give a computer a few bytes of information per second. Mm-hmm. But cameras, it's not. 
like that at all. A tremendous amount of information. Um, and it's been such a such an overwhelming task to sift through that until until now, until deep learning and until CNNs. And then it's a matter of now taking this power and and being able to make it flexible, putting it in the hands of everybody instead of just developers, mm -hmm. going to town with it. Basically, it's it's incredibly exciting time for computer vision. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions. You know, I don't want to go too deep into Matroid, but a couple more questions that came up for me. One is, do you have pre-established relationships with with network supply tv network suppliers so that like a brand agency can just click like i want to monitor abc cnn that kind of thing or yeah. did they have to go find all that themselves no, that seems we, hard we actually have we have the ability to search many tv channels okay and the way we do that is by making sure that we don't infringe upon their copyright mm -hmm. so you can never watch these tv channels on our website you can never mm -hmm even see much of what's going on on there other than the ability to get a notification when your detector mm. figures out what's going on. Okay. And then you only get a notification and a really like a small blurry screenshot okay. so that you can verify that that actually happened. And that stays within fair use. So we, we are absolutely dedicated to making sure we don't step on anyone's toes here. Sure. And that's something that we figured out. So yes, you, you can essentially say, well, I want to watch these few channels Mm -hmm. for my product showing up. And then you can answer questions like, well, when did this car show up next to this other car? Like when, I don't want to pick out any particular brands here, but you right. let your imagination while, like when did car model number one show up next to car model number two? Or when mm -hmm. did car model number one show up? And this would then look at all movies that have been playing, you know, movies of cars in them all the time. They have mm -hmm. brands in them all the time, right? And you, you, you can answer questions like when did a particular kind of laptop show up when particular kind of brand show up in... TV channels across the U.S., mm -hmm. across the world. And do you um, also have and offer like a database of movies so someone can no, essentially not do movies. Like a search? Of... No, not movies. So okay. we, we have streams of media and the streams are the streams are TV channels. Okay. And you, you have the ability to, to hook up your own streams. So we, right. we integrate with many cameras. You can search YouTube videos. You can search static videos that you own. Mm -hmm. We have not curated a large collection of movies. Okay. We... We only have so much resource, you know, to, sure. and we just, we, we want to make it easy for people to search their own libraries. So we've built in tools to, mm -hmm. to allow, the, allow that, but we can't, we can't index all the videos in the world right now. That's mm -hmm. not what we're focused on because right. that's a bit of a different role for us. You know, mm -hmm. if you imagine... If someone has a need to monitor a stream, usually they have the stream themselves, unless right. it's a very popular public stream like TV. If it's movies, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. We just haven't gone there yet. Well, and more generally, it sounds like the core problem is one of monitoring and less of search, which yes. requires kind of the, the broader database. Yes. So in doing all this, one of the key challenges that you faced is how do you scale all of it? And that was a big part of your That's talk right. today. Walk us through some of the things that you talked about. Sure thing. So these models, these machine learning models mm -hmm. that have to decide whether something is happening in a scene or not are computationally very intensive. Mm -hmm. To monitor a stream of video, you have to essentially dedicate around an eighth of a typical GPU card these days. Okay. 24/7. So you can monitor eight streams with one GPU card. Okay. And that's a lot that's a lot of compute. I mean, once you, you would expect that you could do a lot more if if you if that had been optimized, but that's where you can that's mm -hmm. where you can do. And this is which, inference, which yes. is typically much lighter on the GPU than Oh no, training. actually, we do inference on the GPU as well. Inference is it's not typically lighter on the GPU for video mm -hmm. because it's just relative to training, I guess is what I was I mean, they're they're almost equally as really? as difficult when okay. video is involved really? because what's happening is we have a trained model, right? Mm -hmm. Training, sure. Training takes we 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 do both training and inference on GPUs, so mm -hmm. both of these are computationally intensive. Mm -hmm. The reality, though, is actually inference is more computationally intensive for us because the training mm -hmm. happens within a matter of a few minutes because we have many many pre-trained models and. We can build off of a lot of work that has happened in the background, pre-trained mm -hmm. models in particular. The inference, however, you're just constantly running a CNN 
on a video stream twenty four seven. Yeah, and it, that's infinitely long. Right. Whereas training at least is finite, right? Training right. Uh, training <laughs> like is point. like <laughs> is going to take a week. Right. You're done, and then you have a pre-trained model. You can use it or. So inference, the way we, Metroid deals with it, is infinitely long. And mm. so you always, you just have to dedicate an eighth of a GPU to inference for mm -hmm. a stream. Mm -hmm. So that is something we have to deal with. As a company, mm -hmm. we have to deal with that. So first of all, that and means... per stream per detector or yes. you can't... Yeah, so it's per stream per detector. Okay. Per stream per detector. Yeah, so that, that makes it even worse, right? It's, right. it's even right. more computationally it's not like intensive. you're just, you know, you can have multiple networks kind of peering into a stream or sharing sometimes resource, but not often but, enough yeah sometimes that happens and we do optimize for that but it doesn't happen often enough mm -hmm. because the reason you're using metroid is because you want a customized detector you've made a right. detector for your own data usually it's a detector that only you have right and it's a stream that only you have access to mm. and so it's a detector stream okay and so we have a whole cluster that dedicated for this mm -hmm. and the way it works is so these models are quite large themselves too the models are on order of 200 megabytes mm -hmm. and there are millions of them mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of data so just storing the models just storing the detectors already needs a distributed file system s3 right but then some of these models are less often used than others and so we have this four layer cache that goes from distributed file system to the local hard drive of a machine that's dedicated and mm -hmm. has a GPU to regular RAM mm -hmm. that a CPU can access and then smaller GPU RAM, GPU mm -hmm. memory. The hot models, the very hot models sit in GPU memory for mm -hmm. long amounts of time and, and we, we deal with the, with the whole caching infrastructure there. And that infrastructure, did you have to roll your own or yes. is there something that is well, you know, pre-existent to manage that for you? There are tools for general distributed computing. For example, we use Kubernetes. Okay. And Kubernetes is at the level of like cluster resource, management, cluster resource, management, resource, resource management. allocation. You say to Kubernetes, hey, look, I need this many cores and this much memory right. and a GPU. Mm -hmm. And you set up Kubernetes to be able to get those resources from some cloud provider. And ideally, it's all from the same cloud provider, but we have the ability to go through multiple cloud providers mm -hmm. and then you get that resource and you you can run your your workload on it but the fact that there are kubernetes doesn't know that we have millions of models and that we have this whole caching strategy right. it just right. it just gives you resources when you ask them for it it handles some of the fault tolerance and some of the logging which is nice but you know like any rollout of open source software there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into actually productionizing it and making mm -hmm. it good for a particular application. And there's the interface with TensorFlow that, it, that has to work out and the interface to our web environment, which has to work out. So mm -hmm. our, our web app is very complicated. It is the, the video player sure. is constantly talking to the cluster and to, and to other places. These are all, it's like a big symphony orchestra that comes together. <laughs> yeah, the, the specific question that I had was around the, I guess the analogy for me is in the storage arena there's you know the whole idea of you know hot storage cold storage near line all that kind of stuff is well established and there's right. you know tons of you know products and infrastructure and stuff that's like off the shelf that you can mm -hmm. put in place to do that it sounds like what you're doing shuffling data between you know gpu cpu local disk or gpu memory you know ram local disk and distributed storage not a lot pre-existent to facilitate that so you're kind of rolling your own there we absolutely we we built that from the ground up using kubernetes i don't want right. to say we built the cluster management part right but the rest of it is all is all our own in fact my co-founder has a phd in distributed systems okay and and you know we were i work part of my research was the the apache spark library for the machine learning library so mm -hmm. if you, one of my papers is the ml lib library which probably a lot of your listeners know about and there it's it's more about the jvm and an Apache Spark. Well, let's definitely let's seen, come back to that. Yeah, ev that is something we've been working on for a very long time, and we understand those nuances very well. Mm -hmm. We did not pick Apache Spark this time because it's not a go-to tool for, for deep learning, exactly because it, GPUs, its access to GPUs is limited because it sits on the JVM. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, dealing with the whole stack from customized hardware mm -hmm. to having a distributed cluster, all of that isn't well managed by one tool right now. 
Mm-hmm. And so we had to roll our own. And a lot of it really does come to the fact that you have to be able to use customized hardware, like being able to manage a, mach- a cluster where some of the machines have a GPU and some of them don't have a GPU. Mm-hmm. That also matters, right? Mm-hmm. So we will use CPUs when we have no GPU machines available, mm-hmm. but the whole thing will be slower. Mm-hmm. Managing that, again, is is, is one, yet another corner case that we deal with in our, right. in our setup. And are you running all of this on AWS or do you run some of it on a local cluster or? Right now, everything is on AWS. Okay. But we've built everything with the mindset that we should be able to be cloud hybrid. So we should mm-hmm. at the very least be able to access some some custom processing power from other cloud providers. For example, we're looking forward to being able to use TPUs, mm-hmm. the tensor processing units from, from Google when they're available. Mm-hmm. There are multiple hardware providers who are competing on deep learning hardware and mm-hmm. a multitude of, of startups in the space. There's at least five startups that I've counted in this space. Mm-hmm. And all of the chip manufacturers want to get into it. Intel, Qualcomm, Google is not a traditional chip manufacturer, but they they, they will produce chips to rent on GCP. And of course, NVIDIA leads the pack here, right? Mm-hmm. All of these folks are essentially reinventing computing from the ground up to use linear algebra on these specialized co-processors, if you want to call mm-hmm. them that, or tensor processing units. I think the name is going to become tensor processing unit okay. instead of central processing unit. Eventually, we're just going to be using TPUs much more mm-hmm. than CPUs. That chipset is is evolving rapidly, and it's changing all of computing with it. Mm-hmm. And that's incredibly, that's another exciting side effect of, of deep learning. For a long time, we didn't know how computing should evolve to bypass the fact that we can't make clock speeds any faster. Right. And now we've realized that linear algebra operations are the way to go because linear algebra operations can be used in deep learning. They can be used in all of machine learning. They can mm-hmm. be used in so many other applications. Wherever linear algebra is useful, these operations can be made to be useful. That's yet another area that we could spend hours on. Just, just like <laughs> what is the right hardware software interface right. between, just what is the right hardware software interface past the traditional x86 programming model. Right. It doesn't make sense to have simple operations anymore. The hardware should make linear algebra a first-class operation, mm-hmm. a first-class citizen. And that's it's been happening. It's interesting that you are projecting the TPU becomes the general term for this. I was talking to Naveen. From- that's part of the reason I actually named Metroid Metroid is because uh-huh. I expect the term tensor to become more and more popular in computing vocabulary. TensorFlow definitely was a step in that direction. Even yep. NVIDIA now has the word tensor core in their products. So mm-hmm. if the, the new NVIDIA Volta has mm-hmm. many tensor cores, which do small four by four matrix multiplies and accumulates, mm-hmm. that word is creeping around even in NVIDIA. And NVIDIA has all the reason in the world to market the term GPU, right? Right. But even they are using the word tensor. Tensor is used all over the world in deep learning. I think that's the correct, more intuitive term for these processors. Mm-hmm. And then, so this is why we name Matroid as a generalization of tensor. It's also a domain name that sounds good and was available. So, you know, it's hard to find those <laughs> these days. Always helps. But having having your company named after a concept deep Deep mathematical concept is actually very heartwarming and, and it excites a lot of my students to come help us. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So we were talking about scaling. Yes. We talked about infrastructure level concerns. Actually, random question. I keep hearing from a lot of folks talking about Kubernetes that it's actually kind of finicky to get up and running and working well on Amazon. It's been reasonable for us. We have It's been reasonable? Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Been, it's been okay. So... The infrastructure stuff we've talked about, what about the kind of the modeling, training, inference, architecture? Has that evolved, or it has, to what degrees has that evolved specifically to enable distributed compute and scale? So that's a very loaded question. So how have, <laughs> how have models in computer vision evolved is a tremendous long question to answer in itself. Well, and more then, specifically, you, what you guys are doing. Right, right. Like, to what degree, I mean, you're clearly you're thinking about scale mm-hmm. when you're building your systems above the layer of the infrastructure and all of the, you know, movement of bits and, and mm-hmm. compute. 
you know, for folks that are trying to build, you know, that, that have, that are doing deep learning and need to make a skill or computer vision even more specifically, like what are the things that they need to be thinking about, you know, in the computer vision domain right. to enable scale? So even with computer vision, scaling can come in three ways, right? Scaling can come in having many models. It can come mm -hmm. with having very large models and it can come with having large amounts of data, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we already talked pretty extensively about having many models, right? Mm -hmm. That's That was the caching system that I mentioned. So that's let's leave that aside for a second. The other way that scaling can come into effect is having large amounts of data in training. Right? Mm -hmm. So assuming that the model is still small and you have a large amount of training data, we do have that. We So when, when we train, sometimes we train a pre-trained model for weeks. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean we train it, it starts out untrained and then it becomes one of our pre-trained models. Mm -hmm. Now, that's... That's sort of well well understood in, in literature, and it's one of the reasons GPUs became really popular because AlexNet was one of these first neural network architectures that was trained with a ton of data from the ImageNet. Mm -hmm. And that that's sort of well understood, and let's not talk about that too much mm -hmm. right now. The other form of scaling when it comes to models is the model itself. Mm -hmm. So you, you should be able to add more bells and whistles to the model and scaling, scale it up to learn more things as, as you like. And that's actually something that we focused on. It's because as new models come out in open source, we would like to be able to suck them in and make them part of our detector. So if there's a new TensorFlow model out there that can detect logos really well, or if there's a new TensorFlow model out there that can detect the make and model of a car really well, we better be able to integrate that into our system within a matter of an hour's. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are. We have built our setup so that if there's a pre-trained model, a subnet, we call them, out there that is available to learn rapidly a large body of things, we can then hook it up into Matroid so that it becomes a new set of features to use when creating a detector. So mm -hmm. our detectors are essentially a cocktail of pre-trained subnets that some of which are proprietary to us. And we've built, I have a team of three PhDs working on them nonstop, building mm -hmm. these cocktail of, of pre-trained models, mm -hmm. taking them from whenever open source provides them and using whatever we can do to, whatever our customers ask for, we, and we don't have models for, we build them ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the, all of these models are combined together at the end to, okay. to build that one last detector. And then the detector is sort of statically available. So yeah, the short answer is the ability to morph a model, to give it more capabilities by adding subnets to it is something that is very valuable mm -hmm. if, if done right. And that's something that we've we focused on. And I haven't talked about too much because I guess that, that ties into a little bit of our proprietary architectures. And mm -hmm. so we haven't really released much of that. Okay. But it does sound like if your goal is to be able to use off-the-shelf pre-trained models, then... That's not our goal. That's not my goal, right? It's okay. it's to have that be a small part of our system, to be ah, able to essentially have a superset of the capabilities of pre-trained models. Okay, but be able to quickly take advantage of innovations right. outside of your company. Exactly. That's the key there. We, we don't think we can take on the open source community. It would be foolish, right. Right? Right. right? We think that the open source community is, first of all, we contribute back. Like, we commit to... Kubernetes and we submit bugs and we're actually writing a book on TensorFlow and so on. Mm -hmm. There is no point in not embracing open source wholeheartedly. Right. So then the question is, how do you build a product that can both give back and receive from open source? And we think we, this is the way, is to be able to integrate what the open source community finds and discovers as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, those are pre-chained, pre-existing models. You're not changing changing the model architecture can't be kind of how you scale, right? It's your, well, or it can't be, to, or some, to what extent can that be a part of, or is that a part of the way you scale? It is a core part of how we scale to detect more things. So right now we have a Coca-Cola logo detector, say. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to create a detector for Coca-Cola on a t-shirt detector, not mm -hmm. Coca-Cola in, in general, like not on a can, not mm -hmm. on the side of a truck, but only on T-shirts. I'd probably have to create a custom neural network architecture for that. Mm -hmm. Let's say I create that 
and I can I better have an easy way to add that into the Metroid model detection scheme, mm -hmm. and that's the key that we have already. So so that little subnet can go into into Metroid without much effort. And if that subnet happens to be available on in open source, we would pick it out of there and, and put it in. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, if you want to call that scaling, or if you don't want to call that scaling, it seems like we're having a vocabulary thing here. Uh, yeah, I think is so. That, yeah. Is that we, we're increasing the number of things that can be detected by, by adding subnets to mm -hmm. what is being trained. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to call that scaling. Right? Yeah, no, I think you know that. I think the background for this conversation is maybe a interview I did with Shubo Sengupta at Baidu Labs, and we were talking about the Baidu Net research they did for audio and machine translation and things like that. And the conversation was around like some of the same types of issues, like systems challenges, and he went through you know, a lot of low level things like we've talked about, but he also talked a little bit about how, you know, the, the model architecture, some of the decisions they made in architecting their neural nets were made in light of the computational limitations that they had. And I was just curious whether you experienced similar things and whether you adapted model architecture in light of computational network storage constraints, memory constraints, things like that. So for some of our customers who have severe memory restraints and mm -hmm. custom hardware that they would like to run a metro detector on, mm. we have Like edge devices, for example? Yes, exactly. Essentially, you know, one customer who <laughs> wants uh, to run detectors on their own camera. Mm -hmm. okay. For them, we've had to compress and remove a large number of the subnets that we use when training a Metroid detector. Mm -hmm. But that is something that we don't do lightly. There was a lot of engineering effort there and the right. client wanted this so much that they were willing to pay us for that engineering effort. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that we run in the cloud is so that we can afford to have slightly larger models. It's a privilege there in that mm -hmm. environment to be able to, to run larger models. We have, in some cases, had to compress the models and remove the parts that weren't so relevant for computations. And we, we are, in some cases, using TensorFlow Lite for some of these. But we can be a little bit more lazy when it comes to model compression and more okay. focused on model power, detecting many things mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to one or two things. Once again, even in model compression, the open source community has been better than us. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, so the compressed models that we're using for this particular camera did come from open source. So okay. this one... I don't want to say that we've had an innovation in, in putting neural networks on cameras because mm -hmm. we haven't. That innovation came from open source and okay. we are essentially commercializing it. Mm -hmm. The things I worry about is how do we make sure that those innovations that are, first of all, how do we contribute back to open source and make sure that it's, uh, that it's always alive and well? Mm -hmm. But then also how can we make sure to be able to bring innovations there as quickly as possible? How do we engineer architecture to be able to bring in innovations mm -hmm. there as quickly as possible? And the fact that we could bring that innovation in very quickly, the, the, this model that was very tight, very mm -hmm. small, mm -hmm. computationally efficient, but powerful enough for our user, that was very promising, is the fact that we managed mm -hmm. to do that so quickly as a small company. One speaks to the power of open source and two speaks mm -hmm. to our planning. <laughs> right, right. So maybe we can take that step back to talk a little bit about Spark. Let's do that. You've worked extensively on Spark, MLlib in particular. Yes. And yet didn't choose it as the foundation for your architecture. Maybe talk a little bit about Spark and MLlib mm -hmm. and some of the trade-offs that you looked at when you were sure choosing thing. to build up your system. So, you know, we already talked about how the hardware landscape is changing. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely completely changed as far as machine learning goes. Yeah. It's custom chips are the way to go when it comes to machine learning. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Spark, because of legacy reasons, runs on the Java virtual machine, the JVM. Right. It runs there because of Hadoop running there. Initially, mm -hmm. when Hadoop was created out of Yahoo, they decided to run it on the JVM because right. at the time, Java was hot. <laughs> right. There were a lot of developers, and so it, 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 was, it was done. And the thing about Java is that it, makes this promise that you don't have to know what hardware you're running on, mm -hmm. which is an assumption that is just totally goes out the window 
when the hardware software interface is so volatile right now. Mm -hmm. The hardware software interface is no longer an instruction set that is familiar to everybody. Right. It is a vast number of different instruction sets for different chips that have not been standardized the way that the CPU has been. Mm -hmm. right? And as a result, the JVM cannot directly and easily make use of these fancy processors. Mm. Of course, there are ways to make native calls in Java, right. but those native calls in the libraries that have that allow you to, to do those native calls. Is that still JNI? Yes. They, those are still usually a year or two behind the right. hardware coming out. And so you're in this bad situation where some new hardware is out and the software that will let you use that hardware and really only still in a limited capacity, not the full instruction set, comes out in two years after the hardware came out. Right. So you're already two years behind. And as a researcher, then it's, that's unacceptable. Right. So well, as a commercial user as well. That's right. With the pace of the hardware changes, it is absolutely unacceptable. It's the, it's the difference between being competitive or not. Right. Especially for a company like ours, right? Because, like I said, we have to dedicate an eighth of a GPU for infinity right. <laughs> to a stream. Well, and if some new thing comes along that makes that a sixteenth, right? You we better be able use to get it. That quickly. Exactly, exactly. And if our competitors do, then chances are we wouldn't be so happy and maybe even run out of business. So, sadly, Spark lives on the JVM, mm -hmm. and so the question is, how do you get all those benefits in the JVM? You can't easily. Mm -hmm. The way the Spark community is evolving is to be able to plug in to the neural network frameworks that are actually not written in the JVM. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what is the case now, actually we saw at, at the O'Reilly talk right after mine actually, was mm -hmm. about how to run TensorFlow on Spark. Is that the Yahoo folks? I know. No, they did Databricks. Some Databricks, Databricks folks. folks? Okay. The Yahoo folks did do, there's, there are many, tens or... yeah, there are many TensorFlow on Spark packages. Okay. I think I've counted four of them. Okay. It's a good idea, clearly, because so many people are working on it. Right. And this particular talk that I mentioned was a Databricks talk. But actually, yes, Andy Fang and some folks at right. Yahoo Andy, have also right. worked on putting TensorFlow on Spark in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the various approaches to it, but almost all of them involve Spark handling the data munching and grunging, mm -hmm. meaning ETL and just the distribution of data across many machines. Mm-hmm. And then when it comes time to learning, they just spin up a TensorFlow process and just let the TensorFlow process go to town on the data for a long period of time, maybe mm. 10, 20 minutes. It does its thing. And then eventually it spits out a new model. Then Spark does some broadcasting and some communication between machines. And then again, hands back to TensorFlow. So the majority of the time is spent inside a framework that is written not in the JVM, right. written in more closer to hardware. So then, the, you know, the question is, why do that? Why not just, right. just stick to something that's in, that's always in close to the hardware. Close to the hardware. And the answer right. is, there isn't a good answer, right? So actually, the yeah. there's this the lab that Spark came out of at Berkeley, is now moving away from the JVM too. So right. it used to be called the Amp Lab. Mm -hmm. The Amp Lab is is for the sake of creative destruction, they wound down the Amp Lab and mm -hmm. replaced it now with the Rise Lab. Mm -hmm. The Rise Lab owns Spark now. Well, no, that's not true. Apache owns Spark, but the Rise Lab has a lot of people who work on Spark, but mm -hmm. also new projects. And the new projects are, also, are all using C++ mm. because we're back, you know, computing <laughs> has been reset essentially with the, with the resetting of the hardware software interface. Computing has been reset. And so all these mm -hmm. chip manufacturers are also worried now because they're a little bit closer to being competed out mm -hmm. because now that a large body of their moat has essentially been removed and that, that is very powerful for people who are looking to innovate in that space. And machine learning engineers are one of them. People who, who work on machine learning libraries are one of them. And TensorFlow does this quite well in that there's a, because TensorFlow has supposed to run on many different chipsets, mm -hmm. it has a compiler dedicated to be able to compile TensorFlow graphs into many different chipsets, like mm. the Qualcomm chipset and Intel chipset, and of course, CUDA and, and CUDNN. Mm -hmm. I suspect what we'll see is after a long battle, Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe over the course of five to ten years, we'll eventually settle on a new hardware software interface that will look a lot like linear algebra. Mm. Okay, it will be a chipset that, at its core, supports many matrix multiplies—not just many matrix multiplies, many small matrix multiplies, a few 
big matrix multiply. So multiplying two very big matrices together, mm -hmm. multiplying many small matrices together, which is essentially what the NVIDIA Volta is. And then, you know, matrix vector operations and vector vector operations as well. Mm -hmm. Those are actually reasonably well supported with BLAS, which has been around since the 70s. But the, the many, many small matrix multiplies is not well supported in, in the CPU and, and needs to be done in custom chips. And that's, that's part of what will be this new language, this new instruction set mm -hmm. for the CPU, for the, for the new processing unit. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see what that looks like. Once that settles down, then there's time for new JVMs to pop up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the audience didn't see me chuckling as you were describing how the Spark ecosystem, how Spark is running TensorFlow, but it struck me as funny because Spark is like the new yarn for TensorFlow workloads and for some of these In other some ways, modern yes. workloads, yeah. which is somewhat ironic. At the same time, one would expect that Google expands kind of the landscape around TensorFlow to more natively support distributed compute. What's the, I'm not very familiar with the situation there. I was at, trying to remember the name of this, the Google event that I was at where we had a extensive conversation around like integrating Kubernetes more natively with TensorFlow and making it more easy to do distributed TensorFlow compute. What's the general landscape there? So Kubernetes and TensorFlow do play very, very nicely with each other. And TensorFlow does have a distributed mode mm -hmm. where you can have TensorFlow running on many machines or many cores, many GPUs on a single machine. Both of those are supported reasonably well with TensorFlow. And is that... The reason people don't use that is okay. because it's often the case that when they have a lot of amount, a lot of data, they've already set up a Hadoop cluster or a... Okay or a yarn cluster, and so they don't want to just undo all of that engineering. Mm -hmm. They just want to be able to use all that data. And sometimes fault tolerance matters a lot more for them. Distributed TensorFlow, by default, is not fault tolerant in a serious way. So if like your machines go down, that's it. You have to restart the computation, mm -hmm. also restart the machines and everything yourself. Whereas with Spark, you get the fault tolerance. So, okay. But it's actually not clear whether fault tolerance is all that useful for machine learning because mm -hmm. usually these job if you have a training job it, it runs for two three days maybe mm -hmm. and then it's done and and you may be using 10 machines or 100 machines if it's 100 machines for two three days chances are one of them will go down so there you will mm -hmm. care about having fault tolerance but then fault tolerance in machine learning can be as easy as just restarting the machine that died with a version of the models that the other machines had mm -hmm. or a version of the model that's even random and so it's actually not a big deal for machine learning for there mm -hmm. to be failures. And so fault tolerance just doesn't seem like an important deal there. Mm -hmm. But it is an important deal for some people like us. Mm -hmm. If we guarantee to our customers that we're monitoring a stream, we better monitor that stream all the time. Right. And so fault tolerance does matter to Matron. So mm -hmm. we actually have to set up our own fault tolerance mechanisms for the sake of making sure that we always have some detector on a stream. So it, it, the whole landscape is is changing dramatically, and everyone is it's it's a it's very interesting and big fight. Mm -hmm. Maybe I shouldn't call it a fight because there's not necessarily one winner. What will probably happen is data workloads, workloads that are of the form joins, group buys, and selects, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think those will forever stay in Spark mm -hmm. because Spark does them really well. It doesn't matter that they're in the JVM at that point because the difference between the JVM and the difference there is is much less. The CPU is well does joins and group buys well enough. Mm -hmm. It's these machine learning operations that these neural network operations that I think are better suited to, to hardware. Those will be run in TensorFlow. I don't think TensorFlow will ever evolve to a point where it does joins and group buys. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that'll ever happen. Right. And you always need joins and group buys to manage data. Mm -hmm. And so Spark will always have that place. Mm -hmm. Not always, but some tool that does joins and group buys will always have that have that place. And there's no com there's no real serious competitor to Spark. Well, there are, but you know, there none of them are as popular. By extension, the general CPU will always have a place alongside the TPU, right? Yes, unless the instruction sets that the TPUs provide expand. 
mm. and slowly over maybe a decade take over what the CPU does too. Mm. And then the CPU is obsolete. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's going to happen. Interesting landscape. I, there, sure. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if that's going to, it's not, I haven't seen it happening yet. Yeah. But it might, one of these hardware manufacturers might decide, hey, I got a good lead in these cool processor units. Mm -hmm. Why don't I just put a little bit more semiconductors into my coprocessor and make it a full-on processor as well as a coprocessor. Mm -hmm. Or the other way around. Or the other way around. So yeah, it's, gonna, it's definitely, all of that is happening right now and we're watching it. And what it means is that computing gets faster, computing gets more efficient. So I'm just happy that it's happening. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> well, we've got to get you to a flight. Yes. How can folks find you, learn more about what you're up to, explore uh, these topics I'm more? I'm very Googleable. So matroid.com is for Matroid and just Google Reza Zadeh. My homepage shows up. Very easy. Yeah. Awesome. Well, All right. Thank you for so having much. me. It was awesome. I enjoyed the conversation. Learned a ton and we'll be in touch. All right. Thanks. All right, everyone. That is our show. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued support, comments, and feedback. A special thanks goes out to our series sponsor, Intel Nirvana. If you didn't catch the first show in this series where I talked to Naveen Rao, the head of Intel's AI product group, about how they plan to leverage their leading position and proven history in silicon innovation to transform the world of AI, you're going to want to check that out next. For more information about Intel Nirvana's AI platform, visit intelnirvana.com. Remember that with this series, we've kicked off our giveaway for tickets to the AI conference. To enter, just let us know what you think about any of the podcasts in this series or post your favorite quote from any of them on the show notes page, on Twitter, or via any of our social media channels. Make sure to mention at Twimmel AI, at Intel AI, and at the AI Conf so that we know you want to enter the contest. Full details can be found on the series page. And of course, all entrants get one of our slick Twimmel laptop stickers. Speaking of the series page, you can find links to all of the individual show notes pages by visiting twimmelai.com slash OReillyAINY. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.